All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi, I'm Kristen Cooper. I'm from the Economics and Business Department and the Social Science Division here at Gordon. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Franz Lecture. Yeah, this lectureship honors David L. Franz. I never had the pleasure of meeting Professor Franz, but I've heard about him ever since I came to Gordon. Um, David Franz taught history at Gordon for about half a century. He was part of the faculty who made the transition to the Wenham campus from Fenway in the 50s. He was especially known for taking groups of students to Europe on a program called the European Seminar. Uh, apparently, he, they made it affordable. Um, the students and faculty slept in tents and infamously ate peanut butter sandwiches every day for eight weeks of the trip. Um, if uh, Professor Jennifer Hevelone Harper, who unfortunately um, wishes she could be here um, but cannot, she tells us that she knows this firsthand because she traveled with David Franz, he was her advisor, and she ate peanut butter sandwiches with him every day for eight weeks on what was his 30th trip. So a very special person and a special legacy. Um, David was a historian. He was also a visionary who helped shape the social sciences at Gordon. He was um, founding in the founding helped found the departments of political science, psychology, sociology, and economics. Uh, the Department of Economics later became the Economics and Business Department, and of course, in 2024, will become the School of Business. So, kind of a special poignant moment to be together. Um, the Franz Lectureship was generously established by the students, colleagues, and friends of David Franz so that the whole social science division can gather and invite a scholar to address a pressing subject um, in his honor. All right, which, which brings me to this year. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Jeffrey Young to deliver the lecture. Jeff is an emeritus faculty at St. Lawrence University in St. Lawrence, New York. And for the past five years, since his retirement from St. Lawrence and his relocation to Southern Maine, he's been teaching part-time here at Gordon. We have learned from his expertise in Adam Smith and his careful Christian thinking in economics, as he has taught introductory level economics, intermediate macroeconomics, and most recently, Christian teaching on the economy. Come on in. He's also participated in the JAF program. I know we have many JAF folks here. Um, Jeff is also a tremendous scholar. Uh, for those who don't know, he has published dozens of articles and book chapters about Adam Smith, as well as two books. His second book, titled Adam Smith's Theory of Value and Distribution, Economics as a Moral Science Once Again, uh, is the topic of this talk. Um, it was just published by Routledge in January. So in this talk, we will all be challenged to confront the mythologies of Adam Smith the so-called father of modern economics, and the discoverer, discoverer of the so-called invisible hand that guides market economies full of self-interested individuals to mutually beneficial outcomes. But wait, there's more. In the second half of our time together, we will have a unique opportunity. Um, I think it's the first time for the Friends Lecture to have a panel. We're gonna have a discussion about Jeff's work featuring two Gordon faculty members, uh, Paul Brink and Kent Seibert, and two recent alumni who are working in business, Brian Holbert and Sam Solberg. So we're thankful to these folks for participating with us. And I invite the rest of you to consider your questions for the panel um, and question yourself as we are engaging with Jeff's work. So welcome again to everyone, students, faculty, staff, um, family, of, family of the Franzes. Uh, please help me welcome our speaker, Jeff Young. You, I'm okay? Okay, yeah, okay. Thank you, Kristen, uh, for that introduction. I do have to, uh, it did prompt me a, a moment here. Just want to check that I'm right about my own book. <laughs> uh, I just want to point out that the invisible hand is not in the index. But... The Green Bay Packers are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just uh, uh, as Kristen said, we're, we're uh, celebrating my book. We're also celebrating Adam Smith. Uh, this picture in front of you is a statue of Smith that was unveiled on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Wait for it the 4th of July, 2008. Um, I don't have time to comment on the statue, except I'll say that as far as we know, it looks absolutely nothing like him. 
Uh, they, if they put a statue that looked like him on the Royal Mile, it would stop traffic. Uh, but Edinburgh was Smith's domicile for the last 12 years of his life. Uh, he was born uh, approximately 5th of June, 1723. And so the scholarly world has celebrated his 300th birthday just a few months ago uh, in a town of Kirkcaldy, uh, Fife, Scotland, which is right across the Firth of Forth from Edinburgh. Uh, now, rather than father of modern economics, I like to use the, the uh, expression that my mentor used. That he was the Adam and the Smith of, e of economics. <laughs> and a biblically informed audience should be able to uh, work its way through that reference. Uh, now, I think it's entirely appropriate in this context, see if this is going here, uh, entirely appropriate in this context to celebrate Smith, because uh, the, uh, let me get this thing going here, uh, because not only is he the Adam and the Smith of economics, but it, there's also uh, Scottish Enlightenment philosophers also have a strong claim to be the uh, first true social scientists. And so I think that it is doubly appropriate uh, to uh, celebrate Smith uh, within the context of social science and also within the context of economics, which is uh, within the social sciences. Now, I, call, I refer to Smith's economics as a moral science. And to just kind of unpack that a little bit for you, uh, what we call social science today in Smith's day would have been called moral philosophy. And the term moral recognizing the, basically the social nature of, uh, of human nature that the Scottish philosophers assumed to be uh, the case, that we were uh, primarily and essentially created to be social. Uh, and what I hope to show here today is that Smith's economic theory is indeed a moral science of economics one which has definite attractions for Christians. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to, uh, to uh, uh, kind of give kind of a primer on both econo of the economics and the moral philosophy, and then look at, uh, hopefully we'll have time for three specific uh, instances of what I'm talking about. Uh, here's a brief timeline of Smith's life. I uh, don't have time to really delve into biographical material. Uh, suffice it to say that he was a man of letters. Uh, he was a uh, uh, professor in Glasgow University for 13 years uh, and um, basically retired from academic life at, uh, at middle age and spent a great deal of time to write The Wealth of Nations. Uh, but nothing really very exciting there. No. Uh, political career, no military career, no romantic career. Uh, he essentially just lived with his mother most of his life. Uh, for a little bit of an Adam Smith tour of Edinburgh, uh, just down the Royal Mile from the statue is Panmure House, uh, which is Smith's residence from 1778 to 1790 when he died. Uh, the uh, alert student uh, will see the redhead a uh, young lady in the picture who is our daughter, a 2010 alum of Gordon College in history and biblical studies. The really alert student will notice Adam Smith's car uh, parked next to his house, uh, which of course they didn't have garages in Smith's day, so it had to stay out on the street. Uh, if we turn ourselves about 180 degrees and walk a few yards, we come across his gravesite. Uh, at the Canongate Cemetery on the, in Edinburgh. And the inscription just simply says that this is the author of the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. Uh, that that those, were the, those were the, essentially the only two things that Smith wanted to be known for uh, to posterity. There is an inscription in a stone in front of the, the site that t is taken from the wealth of nations about the property that every man, every man has in his own labor, uh, being the original foundation of all other property. 
Now, I've passed out these two quotes for you, uh, so I can tr try to pass over them in the presentation fairly quickly. Uh, but there are two quotations. The first one uh, is that's actually from Book Five of the Wealth of Nations, um, in the context of Smith discussing the um, education of youth, and he the gist of the education, or the gist of the quote, uh, if you look at it in front of you, uh, it, it first talks about people in. The con establishing rules and maxims for the conduct of life. And then he talks about the philosophical endeavor of trying to arrange, make a systematic arrangement of different observations connected by a few common principles. And he says, we see this first in ancient times in systems of natural philosophy and something of this time attempted, was later attempted in morals. The other quotation is a little bit more specific, uh, and it kind of bookends my talk. Uh, it talks about an early rude state of society, and this is dealing more directly and immediately with economics. And it's in this early and rude state of society, he's talking about beaver and deer hunting, and He's making the observation that the quantities of labor necessary for acquiring different objects seem to be the only circumstance which can afford any rule for exchanging them for one another. And I've emphasized the word rule. And then he goes on to unpack that to just restate the principle uh, and ends up with a, with a general principle at the end. It is natural that what is usually the produce of two days or two hours labor should be worth double of what is usually the produce of one day's or one hour's labor. Uh, now, what, do I, what do I want you to notice from these quotations is, first of all, the distinction between rules and principles. Uh, and this goes hand in hand with a distinction of perspective from which Adam Smith writes and places his audience in the perspective of ordinary life versus the perspective of philosophical reflection. The theory of moral sentiments is essentially written from the first perspective. The wealth of nations generally is written from the second perspective. Um, and it is from the first perspective that people make those rules that he's talking about in that quotation, an example being don't hurt anyone, uh, which can be subdivided into specific ways that you can hurt people and adv admonish people not to do that. And philosophers make principles such as natural rights or before there was moral philosophy, as he said, there was natural philosophy, uh, principles about the operation of the uh, natural non-human world. Now, the thing about rules and this per, uh, perspective is, is, is brought out in the second quotation, uh, which is essentially an example of this distinction between rules and principles carried into uh, the value theory chapters material in the Wealth of Nations. Uh, historically, Smith believed rules emerge first. Uh, a principle is inferred from observation. Uh, and so there has to be, in the, in the social world, there has to be something to observe first before there can be any uh, philosophical reflection uh, in, uh, towards uh, explaining uh, human behavior or human nature. Uh, and the thing about rules is not only they, they, is that they emerge, because this is the context of ordinary life, they emerge spontaneously without any design, any plan, or any government oversight because they precede uh, any kind of formal government. They precede, in Smith's theory, any kind of codes of law uh, and any kind of um, uh, sort of top-down uh, direction that people can refer to. Uh, now, they also occur in the context of 
uh, an, the absence of any kind of divine revelation. Uh, and so, of course, we know that the, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, are also a source of revelation as to how we should conduct ourselves. Uh, but these Smith's context here is, a, is people who don't have this. There's not a, it's not available to them to learn from and refer to. Refer to. Uh, so in exchanging beaver and deer, for example, no one's trying to promote the good of society. They just want some meat and some fur. Uh, and the question for, for, from an economics perspective is Smith proposing a labor theory of value, which link, leads me to a brief primer on the value theory in the wealth of nations. Uh, and this is, have to be really ver pretty, uh, very uh, kind of just hitting the, the surface here, but to get at some of the, uh, the, the concepts, some of the issues of interpretation, and my understanding of what he actually is doing and, and, and meaning here. The first thing he does is notice that the word value has two different meanings. Uh, he calls those meanings use value and exchange value. And then he immediately states uh, what's known as the diamond and water paradox, or just the paradox of value. No, I'm not ready for that yet. Um, and the, the gist of the quotation is, if you, uh, if you define use value very narrowly and very objectively, uh, as useful for the sustaining of life. With that, take that definition into the context here. What he's saying is that on that definition of use value, water is very useful, diamonds are not. And then he contrasts that with their exchange value, what they uh, can command or exchange for in a marketplace. And he says that, well, water doesn't exchange for hardly anything. Because Smith lived in a water abundant region of the world. Uh, and so there wasn't any need to, um, you know, to conserve it much or to, or it wouldn't therefore command much of a price in the marketplace. But diamonds, on the other hand, are purchased by rich people, have lots of money to spend, and so they have very high exchange value. Uh, as I said, this became known as the paradox of value. Uh, in modern economics, we teach that the market price is the marginal use value, not the total use value. And by that we mean, uh, the, I think the most intuitive way to understand the concept of marginal use value is to ask the question, uh, con considering all the water you consume in a day, what would you cut out if the price of water went up a little bit? In other words, if, the, if they're paying $5 a gallon or, or 10 cents a gallon for water, and now you have to pay 12 cents a gallon for water, what do you cut out? That is the marginal use of water in, on, in your budget. And that is the, the value of that is its marginal that use value. And so there's going, it, we have that way of explaining it in modern economics. However, this paradox resulted in mythologies that ran throughout the 19th century and still populate our, our history of economic thought textbooks. Uh, it is still uh, brought, widely thought to be true about Smith that he has stated a paradox. Uh, secondly, he didn't know the answer to the paradox because he didn't have this concept of marginal value. Uh, and thirdly, he divorced, therefore divorced the two types of value that uh, implied and further implied that the demand side of the market had nothing to do with price determination, leaving us with cost of production or a special case of cost of production, labor expended, the amount of labor expended, uh, as, the, as the elements that determine the price in the market. And the mythology then concludes that Smith set price theory at least back 100 years uh, because the solution to the problem was already known. 
uh, he already knew, he had been taught it and uh, somehow forgot it. Uh, but as I'll explain here in a moment, uh, it's, he didn't forget it at all. Uh, and, um, but as value theory developed, especially in the English-speaking world in the 19th century, uh, the, the, the myth was that what they, taught, what they believed about Smith is also what they believed to be true which was that if you wanted to understand value, you had to understand the determinants of the costs of production, in particular, quantity of labor involved. Uh, but this, uh, as I'm trying to indicate, if it's a mythology, it must probably is not true. At least I'm probably going to treat it as something that's not true. Because first of all, there's no indication that he's stating a paradox there. Uh, it is really simply an, an observation of fact. Uh, he doesn't actually have, have that concept of use value that he uh, consistently uses throughout the Wealth of Nations. I think he's just using it to, uh, 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 for the purposes of simply saying these are two different concepts. You know, don't, con you know, don't confuse the two different concepts. Uh, and the... Uh, the, the uh, there's a quotation here that indicates fairly clearly that he did not hold to a cost of production theory of value uh, because he's, he's, this is elsewhere in the book, but he's looking at the fact that uh, superior wines are command a higher price in the market than ordinary wines and that therefore the landlords that own the superior vineyards get more rent. Uh, for their land, uh, and the superior wines are also more carefully cultivated. And so there is greater cost, higher price. But he's very clear that the greater cost is because of the higher price, that the reason why the lands are cultivated more carefully is because the wine is more valuable indicating that value is not something that's being created in production. It's something that's, that exists in the market uh, where the final consumer is going to buy the commodity. Now, this statement had no impact on the development of economics uh, uh, as we you know, throughout the next 100 years. But it's fairly clear that uh, Smith does not belong in this mythological history of thought that I spelled out for you a few moments ago. Uh, where does it, but where does this leave us with respect to the idea of a labor theory of value? Because I did show you a quote that's on your possession that fairly strongly indicates that Smith at least started out some, at some point with a labor theory of value. Now, uh, a brief primer on the labor theory of value. Uh, it could involve one or both of two claims. Either it could mean that labor is the sole creator of value, or it could mean that relative quantities of labor embodied regulate the relative prices of or, and relative price movements. Uh, that principle that he stated in the end of the beaver and deer paragraph uh, is a reflection of that claim. Uh, because the relative price is how many beaver exchange for, is the idea that uh, two deer are going to exchange for one beaver because both of those quantities represent equal amount of some labor. Uh, nothing about the, uh, what creates value, though. Uh, Marx, on the other hand, who plays a, uh, a role in my book, a lesser role in my presentation here, believe both of these claims. Uh, Marx believed that uh, labor was the sole creator of value uh, and that the relative quantities of labor determine relative rates of exchange in the market. Now, Smith actually has two labor theory concepts. Uh, one is labor, called labor embodied. I've used that expression. I don't think that he actually used the word embodied, uh, but he did definitely have that idea in the, the paragraph that's in front of you. 
The other labor theory concept that he had is labor commanded. Now, uh, labor embodied is simply how much labor does it take to make a commodity. Uh, it is the theory, as I said, that Marx accepted uh, as the truth, and it's a theory that's still pinned to Adam Smith by a wide variety of people. Uh, but Smith didn't believe that. So he, for, for Marx, the expenditure, Marx assumed that the commodity had use value, and so that was just sort of set aside. Uh, and so he, has, he then argued that, or believed, that um, embodying labor into the commodity creates value. And so he believed that the value of the commodity was already there when it came to market. Uh, and that the function of the market was to realize the value that was already in the in the commodity. That, I think, is the clearest and strongest expression of the idea that cost of production determines value. Uh, because it's, the idea is that it's expending resources that creates value. Uh, whereas Smith, in my line example, is fairly clear. The value is at the end of the line. Uh, in what you can sell the wine for. And the costs are incurred because of that greater value. So Smith is turning, of course, he's not turning Marx on his head because he's, Smith has been dead for 100 years when Marx is writing. Uh, but Smith, in my, it, you know, it's, to me, is clearly a mistake, not just a mistake of interpretation, but a mistake of understanding economics to put Smith into this same camp. Uh, but however, it is the rule that emerges in this early state. But as I'll try, as try to wrap this up at the end, Smith is not in this early state with the beaver and deer. It's not, there's no market there. It's not actually about a market and the determination of exchange values in the marketplace. Now, turning to the other side, labor commanded is answers the question, how much labor does a commodity, once it has been made, command in the market? It can also be turned around and said, how much commodity does labor, once it's paid, command based on its wage and based on the price of the commodity? Uh, in other words, it's asking the question that what is the worker's real income? Uh, and he prefaces this, or precedes it by saying that a person is rich or poor according to their ability, their command over goods. Uh, Smith's economy didn't produce services. But we can you know, correct that for ourselves. This, this uh, concept is easily compute, computed as the money price of a good divided by the money wage. And I'll show you in a moment, I'll show you in a few minutes, I'll show you an example uh, of this. What he's doing is measuring, not determining, he's measuring changes in real wages when money prices and money wages are both changing. Uh, it has nothing to do with the price determination, with the determination of exchange value. It has to do with, uh, since commodities are bought and sold with money, uh, they have a nominal value and they have a real value. And he's asking the question, uh, we know what the nominal value is because the money is, price is stated right there and we can observe it, but we don't know what the real value is uh, without making some calculation, because we need to be able to know how this relates to command over goods, or to the way that he specified it, command over labor. Now, before we get back to that, here's a brief primer on the moral philosophy. Uh, and I have to be very brief with this. This is the sympathy, sympathy model. This is, the, this is the theory of moral sentiments 
uh, in 25 words or less, basically. Uh, I boiled it down to one simple model. He, of course, takes this model and makes it tremendously more complicated and does some really uh, fairly nuanced analysis with it. Uh, which we can't get get into, and some of which I'm not even competent to um, to try to explicate for you. But the basic the model is we have an agent A that something has happened to A called a cause, and A responds to that with an effect. An effect. A does something, says something, performs some action that has been prompted by something that has occurred, that has occurred to A. And this, in turn, this, this action or statement or whatever has an effect on another agent, B. There is a third agent called S, representing the spectator, uh, that Smith treats as an impartial observer. Uh, and if S, just looking at A, engaging in a process of sympathetic identification with A, uh, if S, in doing that, judges the action that A does, the effect, appropriate for given its cause, then S judges that the A, A has behaved according to propriety. Uh, propriety for Smith is the fundamental, most basic uh, moral judgment, uh, and the most uh, basic, uh, as I said, both the foundation of all other moral judgments. As I said, he compl significantly complicates it, uh, but the important, really the important concept here is what is meant by this sympathetic identification. And I talk about S, the spectator experiencing a sympathetic copy of A's emotions. Uh, this is a, a process that entails one human, be one human mind imaginatively entering into another human mind without, verbal, without necessarily any verbal communication and, at, and determining if, if, they were, if they were were that other person, would they respond the same way? In other words, would the cause produce the same emotion, the same feeling, and the same effect uh, for this spectator as it does for the person immediately involved? Uh, and if they, if they do, there is a pleasurable experience of concord of sentiments. Uh, it is, and I call it here, a sympathetic copy. Uh, it, the best analogy that I know of is the physical principle of sympathetic vibration, where one tuning fork can cause another tuning fork to start to vibrate by bringing them in proximity to each other. It's a technical concept that Smith is using to make a scientific explanation of how moral judgment takes place uh, among human beings. The upshot of this, because this concord of sentiment, Smith actually uses the musical analogy of concord and harmony. Uh, this concord of sentiment is pleasurable, and because they, of that, these agents will want to try to achieve it, and that will entail some kind of equilibration process where the person principally involved has to tone down their emotions so that a, an observer can sympathize with them. And the observer, in some sense, has to heighten their emotions so that because from their perspective, the other agent is a spectator, is an observer. Uh, and so they, there is an equilibrating process here that goes on of, act, of equilibrating action with approval. Uh, and this is the process, I believe, that uh, Smith, in the first quotation, uh, refers to as the um, common consent, 
that these, these rules and maxims emerge by common consent. It's not a voting process, it's a sympathetic interaction process that doesn't require any formal institutions uh, to be in place. In fact, it's the basis upon which Smith argues that formal institutions such as justice and law come into existence in the history of, of humanity. Now, as, uh, as briefly as I can, I have three examples here of the self-interest model in the wealth of nations. Um, how am I doing for time? <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I think I can go through these fairly quickly now that I've laid the groundwork. First one is the, the big one, the big guy, self-interest. The so-called self-interest axiom in economics is derived from this quotation, which is the most often quoted passage in all of economics, that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker, that we expect our dinner, but from a regard to their own interest. But in the very same paragraph, we have Smith imagining this little conversation taking place uh, in which uh, one agent says to the other, give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want. And this is the meaning of every such offer, and it's through this that we attain our, the good offices that we need. Now, uh, this is the perspective of ordinary life that we are placed into, which presumably me means that the sympathy model is operative. In fact, the sympathy mechanism here is, I would say, is stimulated by conversation. And I call them social agents because they are engaged in conversation. They're talking with each other. Uh, and there's, there's no talking in, in economics, by the way, uh, in our models. Nobody talks to anybody. Um, but the, the problem with the self drawing the self-interested axiom out of this passage is the pesky little word, you. How does the I in the passage know what the you in the passage wants? And I claim that it's through sympathetic identification with the you. Uh, and of course, the implication is that it's going the other way as well, that the you is doing the same thing with the I uh, in the passage. And so I claim that these are not the individualistic, atomistic agents that populate our modern economics textbooks. Um, and that furthermore, we can see the golden rule. They're doing for each other what they want the other one to do for them. And the exchange is initiated by wants. Okay? Costs are going to, you know, will have to come later. Second example is the real wage. Um, I already... I think that it's better, it's more intuitive to call it time price rather than late Smith's kind of clumsy labor commanded, uh, representing the amount of time it takes to earn the money to buy a good. And I simply, the best way to do this is just to give you an example. Uh, Smith's method is essentially the inverse of what we do in modern economics. And so if they're, they're e it, technically speaking, they're sort of equally valid. Uh, equally analytically uh, good, although they're, uh, for the, what they do, we, there's probably nothing that can be perfect. But anyways, here's an example from modern research of using Smith's method. William Nordhaus tried to calculate the real price of light in Smithian terms uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, he's a recent Nobel laureate in economics um, at uh, Yale University. Uh, and this is just, just this is one just snippet from a fairly large piece of pretty large piece of research. Uh, but he took light because light can be measured physically. Uh, 
in terms of lumen hours. And he, asked, tr he tried uh, through you know, some of the ingenious aspects of the research of trying to trace this thing way back like he did, thousands and thousands of years. But at one, back in the Neolithic period, he estimated that it took a human being 58 hours to produce 1,000 lumen hours of light. And with the compact fluorescent bulb in the 1990s, it took seven one thousandths of a second to produce a thousand lumen hour, to buy, I should say, a thousand lumen hours of light. Uh, now, how many of you react to that and say, oh, that doesn't make any sense? Or how many of you react and say, wow, that's a pretty major com difference, okay? What I would submit is, to you is that we, we're implicitly, sympathetically identifying with the worker, with, a, with, a, with the, this amount of time of, Smith called it toil and trouble. Uh, he also called it um, skill, dex, ordinary degree of skill and dexterity. Uh, and his ease, his liberty, and his happiness. Uh, but there is evidence that he actually um, uh, had the sympathy model in mind uh, in talking about sympathetically identifying with uh, labor time, with the toil and trouble of labor time. Uh, I'm going to have to pass over this one here. And then lastly, we'll get back to the beaver and deer. Uh, what I, I mentioned that uh, there was no market. And the reason that, one reason that I say that is because uh, this activity that he's talking about probably preceded the development of a market. But also it's because... What's going on here, at least initially, I believe, in, Smith, in Smith's account, is gift giving. Uh, and that the rule is a rule of gratitude. Uh, and that the gift giving does entail reciprocity, such as we have in the, you know, give me this and, I'll, and you can have that. Uh, it does involve reciprocity, but it would be uh, in, an informal sort of reciprocity. And the, um, the, inform the informal rule of, well, if you, if you spent two hours hunting to do this, then I'm, I'm going to reciprocate with two hours of something that I can give for you. Um, so it is, I think a rule of gratitude. There is some textual, more specific textual evidence in his lecture notes where he's talking about, uh, he's not talking about beaver and deer, but he's still talking about hunting and, and bo making bow and arrows in this early and rude state. And he sa makes it explicit that somebody's better at making arrows, so he makes them ends up with surplus, and he gives them to his neighbor. And somebody's better at deer hunting, and so he's got a surplus, and he gives some meat to his neighbor. Uh, and that's um, my take on the beaver and deer, uh, whether or not this is a, it's certainly not a labor theory of value in anything like what it became in uh, the development of economics uh, through the um, through Marx, anyways, in the classical era. Um, and uh, I'll skip over the technical aspects of this. So, what do I conclude? Well, I have concentrated on the negative. I have tried to debunk myths rather than do the positive uh, of. Well, what did Smith say about value theory? Well, in my book, I pretty much say, well, it's supply and demand. Uh, and I use Econ 101 graphs, supply and demand graphs, which I think are completely consistent with his text. 
uh, to uh, illustrate it. Uh, I'd also believe that I've, sus that I've sustained my claim or substantiated my claim uh, that this is a moral science of economics and that it has definite attractions for Christians. Uh, it has found the human dignity uh, can be seen implicit in the I and you discussions. Uh, the vision of sympathetic exchange is uh, clearly a, it indicates the presence of the golden rule. Uh, common grace is also operative in the uh, unintended order that these rules emerge without any design or plan uh, and end up being beneficial to the preservation of society without the agents in the, in the, in the, in the ordinary life context having any intention to do that. Smith is not blind to sin, uh, but I haven't concentrated on those as aspects where he talked uh, uh, about it. Uh, and to me, anyways, he's a worthy exemplar of uh, how what the sort of economist I would like to be. So that's it. Huh. That's the... <laughs>